Hello, everybody. Great to be with you again. My name is Michael Millerman, millermanschool.com. And today I thought that we would, like we used to do, go over an article. This is from foreignpolicy.com. It's a couple of days old. The Secret Postmodern Radicalism of Francis Fukuyama. He cheerleads for liberal democracy in public, but quietly admits he's unsure of its true strength. You should know foreignpolicy.com. It's a nice place to go to, read some free articles, subscribe if you'd like to, and the author of this piece is Blake Smith, a Fulbright scholar in North Macedonia. I had a quick look in advance at this piece. I saw that it mentions Leo Strauss and Alan Bloom, so I thought we might as well have a look together. In his most recent book, Liberalism and Its Discontents, published this year, Author Francis Fukuyama argues that the virtues, quote unquote, of liberal democracy must be clearly celebrated, excuse me, clearly articulated and celebrated. This injunction is a curious one. For more than three decades, Fukuyama has been one of the most prominent public intellectuals, making the case again and again in various genres that liberal democracy is the best form of government available. What has he been doing all this time if the case for the regime is not yet clear? So how could Fukuyama have been championing liberal democracy if the virtues of liberal democracy haven't been clearly articulated and celebrated? Fukuyama presents himself in this book as an advocate rather than a scholar or philosopher. The premise of social science as practiced in modern universities is that it is possible to consider political things without assigning praise or blame. The premise of philosophy is that it is possible to consider such things in theory in at least a temporary withdrawal from the practice of politics. Fukuyama tells readers from the outset that these are not his aims. So let's look again. He doesn't have the aim of social science, of considering political things without assigning praise or blame in some sort of quote-unquote neutral or objective scientific perspective. And he doesn't have the aim of considering these things in theory in withdrawal from the practice of politics. Shaping public opinion through, how do you pronounce that word? Read it a million times. Peons? Peons? Peons to one's regime seems to him to be not only a reasonable, avowable goal, but one that he faults other political thinkers and activists for abandoning. He, Fukuyama, scolds both conservatives and progressives in the United States for their growing distrust of the quote-unquote democratic process. That is, from the shaping of opinion through discourse. Republicans aligned with former U.S. President Donald Trump are ever more skeptical of the fairness of elections or indeed of the idea that those opposed to their agenda can be considered so-called real Americans. The left, meanwhile, has promoted what Fukuyama sees as a divisive form of politics organized around group identities through courts, executive agencies, and their substantial social and, and uh, cultural power. Neither side appears able or interested in attempting to secure a broad social consensus for a version of their agenda that could appeal to the material interests and values of most of their compatriots using traditional democratic means, rhetorical appeals substantiated by political action aimed at the legitimate demands of ordinary people. So Fukuyama scolds the conservatives and the progressives both for their growing distrust of the democratic process, quote unquote. This failure appears to strike Fukuyama not only as regrettable, but as frighteningly reminiscent of the political impasse that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Fukuyama worked in the 1980s as an analyst studying the Soviet military, as he was also laying the intellectual foundation for his famous thesis on the end of history. In his 1989 essay, A Reply to My Critics, he argued that the Soviet Union under then leader Gorbachev was witnessing a collapse of ground level social order, evidenced by the rapid growth of ordinary crime, and a loss of elites moral authority brought about above all by their loss of faith in their regime as the embodiment of a universalistic idea, communism, that history was directed to fulfill. It would be a terrible misreading to imagine that Fukuyama was gloating about the fall of liberal democracy's last significant ideological rival. Rather, he was then and continues to be concerned that the Soviet Union's fate could be the United States fate if elites and ordinary people lose their hope in the movement of history toward the global victory of its ideals and if intellectuals neglect their mission to justify this hope. Let me just pause. Those of you who are here, we're reading this article, Francis 
Fukuyama, The Secret Postmodern Radicalism of Francis Fukuyama in Foreign Policy Magazine, published December 18th. And the author, to give all credit where it's due, was Blake Smith. You know, if you followed my work on Dugan or if you're familiar with Alexander Dugan, that uh, Fukuyama has been someone Dugan writes about, has been interviewed with, has himself interviewed. And the idea of the end of history is obviously always one that Dugan takes aim at in different ways. And not only Dugan, of course, but most prominently, probably for the followers of this channel, Dugan. So let's go back down to where we were here. Since the publication of his essay, The End of History in 1989, and subsequent book, The End of History and the Last Man, three years later, Fukuyama is usually discussed and often criticized by pundits for having claimed straightforwardly that liberal democracy has already triumphed. In the first paragraph of a reply to my critics, reflecting on the surprising celebrity of his controversial essay, he complained, my real accomplishment has been to produce a uniquely universal consensus on the fact that I was wrong and that history has not in fact ended. Nearly all of his readers missed his much more subtle point re-elaborated in that reply. The end of history in the, in the Last Man, and still again in Reflections on the End of History five years later, so a point that Fukuyama has made repeatedly, that the prospect of liberal democracy overtaking all alternative forms of government cannot be an object of rational certainty, but only of hope. This hope is inseparable from Fukuyama's fear that if the world does not imagine history to have a progressive character, trending towards the spread of their own political values, then their adherence to liberal democracy and thus the regime itself will be fatally undermined. So you need the faith in the progressive character of history. You need to believe that the arc of justice bends towards a liberal democratic globalist world order. You need to hope because without that hope, you don't have the energy that you need and the vigor that you need for a defense of liberal democracy. Without this hope in history, this faith in history, this belief in history, in progressive history, without this hope in history, the United States will come to the same end as the Soviet Union. So you have to be very much on guard against anybody who undermines the hope and the faith and the belief in the fact that history tends toward an end, a liberal democratic end. Fukuyama from 1989 to the present seems to have taken it upon himself to give grounds to this politically necessary hope. But his career-long project of articulating and celebrating liberal democracy is a complex one that speaks to multiple quite different audiences. In an interview published in 2011, he, Fukuyama, reflected on how he addresses these quote-unquote competing audiences. There is, on the one hand, a set of academic specialists to whom he speaks mostly in footnotes, and on the other hand, a broader but shrinking residual audience of Americans interested in intellectual and political life. This group, he insists, are not the general public, but a general readership. The public presumably no longer reads and are thus beyond the reach of intellectuals, except perhaps by the most indirect means. Few of Fukuyama's readers have attended to his avowed concern for speaking at different registers to distinct groups, or considered how these various ways of speaking contribute or fail to contribute to his project of shoring up our collective faith in our form of government. But without such attention, we cannot understand his intellectual and political career or what the difficulties his project has encountered might tell us not only about Fukuyama as a thinker, but about the problems of the regime he defends, liberal democracy. So we carry on here. That's a picture of Fukuyama and Gorbachev at a conference in Moscow in 2007. Nice to be with you, by the way. Thanks for tuning in, reading this article on the postmodern radicalism of Francis Fukuyama from foreignpolicy.com. You can already tell if you know some Leo Strauss uh, that this is heading towards a discussion of Strauss and his students with this idea of addressing several audiences uh, at one time. Fukuyama learned how to speak to multiple audiences, the article continues, from his undergraduate professor at Cornell University, Alan Bloom, who published his best-selling The Closing of the American Mind, How Higher Education Has Failed Democracy and Impoverished the Souls of Today's Students, 1987, shortly before inviting Fukuyama to the University of Chicago to give a lecture that would be the first iteration of the end of history thesis. By the way, I pause and tell you that if you haven't read The Closing of the American Mind, you should. I think you would enjoy it. 
Bloom saw liberal democracy, even at the moment of its victory in the Cold War, as menaced by what he described in a 1989 response to Fukuyama as the dark possibilities of fascism. A revival of ethno-nationalist resentment, pitched against liberalism, he warned, could come both from white majorities threatened by immigration, as well as from minorities who were taking up through the American Academy's reappropriation of philosopher Martin Heidegger, political theorist Carl Schmitt, and other far-right liberal thinkers, fascist arguments against modernity. And since their names came up, let me just remind you that if you go to millermanschool.com, you'll see courses on Martin Heidegger, Carl Schmitt, and other far-right liberal thinkers, but uh, not for the sake of fascist arguments against modernity, but because we want to learn what we can from the critics of the world we know. Following his own teacher, Leo Strauss, who himself inherited this perspective in part from philosopher Henri Bergson, Bloom suggested to students and readers, perspicacious enough to pick up his hints, that society would collapse unless it were held together by its members' collective faith and a common set of beliefs. So you guys can ask yourselves as I read this out, is it the case that all societies, in order to be what they are, in order not to collapse, need to be held together by a collective faith, and that therefore we should be careful about undermining that collective faith publicly in a prominent way that undermines it and therefore risks the collapse of the political community. For those who wished to pursue what the Straussian tradition calls the philosophical life of independent thought, they would be prudent to do so under the cover of outward fidelity and conformity to traditional norms. Right? You don't want to rock the boat. You don't want to undermine the common belief of the political community in which you live and on which you depend to a certain extent. If you're going to reach out to philosophers who transcend the opinions of the political community, you have to do so carefully. That's my commentary, my gloss here, for those of you who don't know Strauss so well. At most, they, the philosophers, might, through the careful use of political rhetoric, gradually modify collective beliefs, bringing them closer into alignment with the truth as they understand it. Fukuyama seems to have learned from Bloom both the necessity and the means of shaping public opinion, molding it into the sort of consensus without which they feared the U.S. regime cannot survive. Fukuyama's early work on the end of history shows the influence of Bloom and Strauss. It speaks to multiple audiences, endorsing a critical, almost ironic support for liberal democracy while signaling to the more attentive readers its weaknesses and flaws. More radically, and in what seems to constitute the great originality of this thinking, Fukuyama distinguishes between two arguments in favor of the U.S. regime. One, a philosophical or psychological argument based on an understanding of human nature, will be, he suggests, incomprehensible to all but a few members of his audience. Because, I add, how many people really think through to the relationship between human nature, its philosophical foundations, and the meaning of our political community. So relatively few members of the audience do that. The other, the historical argument about the quote-unquote end of history, is in fact an inferior argument, but it alone can convince ordinary readers. Maybe because it has that eschatological, religious type structure. Let's see. The psychological argument runs as follows. In reality, Fukuyama observes, toward the conclusion of the end of history in The Last Man, liberal democracy constitutes the best possible solution to two apparently and at times actually contradictory desires felt in different degrees by all people. The world has, on the one hand, a passion for equality, or isothumia, and, on the other hand, a passion for superiority, or megalothumia. People want to be recognized as being good to other people, and they are indignant when they or others are denied this recognition. On the other hand, it seems essential to people's ability to have a good life, that is, a life of one's own, defined in accordance with some personal standard not identical with public norms, that they be able to imagine themselves as possessing a certain kind of excellence, and even achieving recognition for it among others, who might be only their own families or a happy few who know how to appreciate them. Liberal democracy, the author continues, protects people from the humiliations of openly declared hierarchies of human value, while also enabling them to channel their ineradicable, ineradicable snobbism and competitiveness into harmless and even socially useful activities. 
No other regime meets these two contradictory needs with so great an equilibrium. However, while modern societies have evolved toward democracy, as the balance of isothumia and megalothumia shows, modern thought has arrived at an impasse and is unable to generate a rational defense of the form of government that best accommodates people's deepest desires. So why? Now we have these two arguments for liberal democracy for its unique excellence in comparison to all other regime types, if you think that people have these two needs, isothumia and megalothumia. But why then is it at an impasse? Why is it unable to generate a rational defense of the form of government that best accommodates people's deepest desires? Well, the author continues, this is because since the 18th century enlightenment, and with particular urgency since the thought of philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, it has become more and more difficult for Western intellectuals to believe that there is in fact such a thing as human nature, in light of which people could know objectively which form of government best fulfills their needs. So I intersperse my commentary here. There's been a war on the notion of nature, a war on the notion of human nature, a war on the notion of natural needs and hierarchies. Nature has been expelled with a pitchfork. Most intellectuals today imagine that people vary so greatly across different societies throughout history that it is meaningless, or worse, a Eurocentric offense to speak of human nature. Obviously a terrible mistake in uh, my opinion and in the opinion of my teachers, but let's continue here. Modern societies are, as liberal democracies, heirs to the 18th century age of revolutions in which the founders of the American and French republics declared that the universality of human nature entailed universal rights. Okay, the universality of human nature. But confronted by historicist and relativist critiques, meaning there's no such thing as universal nature because humans are what we take them to be in any given time. That's sort of the historicist side. And relativistic, you know, human nature is relative to your customs, relative to this, that, your time, place, your beliefs, and so on. So confronted by historicist and relativist critiques, issuing from social sciences, as well as new perspectives from biology, experts seem unable to provide a rational basis for the declaration, namely the, again, you used to have declarations of the universality of human nature that entail human rights, but now you don't, okay? You don't. Experts seem unable to provide a rational basis for that declaration, which perhaps persists among people now only as an antiquated, increasingly unpopular article of faith. Like, how can you be so dumb as to believe in a universal human nature. Haven't you read the latest social psychology, biology, historiology, and all of that? Don't you know Nietzsche? Don't you know Heidegger? Fukuyama observes that many leaders of those founding revolutions, such as former U.S. President Thomas Jefferson, held that liberal democracy required a supplementary belief to ward off the corroding force of skepticism about the rational basis of human rights. In other words, here, if we can just put a gloss on that, you need a type of civil religion that legitimates the basic beliefs of the political order. And you certainly don't want that public religion to be publicly undermined. The impasse of modern thought foreseen by those Enlightenment thinkers cannot be overcome by any of their contemporary descendants, Fukuyama concludes. Liberal democracy, although it is the best form of government, has no intellectual defender capable of convincing its supporters and detractors that there truly is a trans-historical human nature that can serve as the basis of comparison among different regimes. Let me just pause. I want to read that again, but I also want to ask you, do you think that liberal democracy, this combination of isothumia and megalothumia, or just any regime you could say, here we have human rights, does it need to rest on some foundational doctrine about the nature of man. Because here we had that, right? Only if there's a universal nature to man can we have a rational defense of, rational defense of universal human rights. But because we don't seem to be able to defend the universality of man anymore, therefore the political universality of rights has been undermined. So let me just read it again. Liberal democracy, although it is the best form of government, has no intellectual defender capable of convincing its supporters and detractors that there truly is a trans-historical human nature that can serve as the basis of comparison among different regimes. Okay, a very serious problem, one that forced Leo Strauss to think through the whole history of political philosophy all the way back to Plato, 
through the quarrel between the ancients and the moderns to the three waves of modernity culminating in Nietzsche and Heidegger. So a very serious problem there to think through. The best that its supporters can do, the best that the supporters of liberal democracy can do, Fukuyama argues, is hope that over the coming course of history, events continue to unfold as they have, moving in favor of the stability and spread of liberal democracy. In other words, for example, you need Ukraine to win. If Russia had defeated Ukraine, this is me commenting here, quickly and decisively, there would have been real doubt as to the end of history thesis about the superiority of liberal democracy. So the Western world that's trying to provide liberal democracy, not with a rationalist underpinning, but with a hope, must ensure that Ukraine does not lose. Anyway, as the latter are victorious over its most challenging rivals, fascism and communism may become more plausible to people, the relativist impasse of modern thought will in a sense solve itself. You don't need philosophical arguments against liberal democracy. You don't need a refutation of Nietzsche or Heidegger. You don't need a proof, a rational proof of the universality of human nature. You just need victories over the opponents of liberal democracy. On the ground and not in the books, according to Fukuyama, as we get him so far in this presentation. The idea that liberal democracy stands at the, quote, end of history, in other words, is a sort of second best belief, something to be inculcated in those who are unable to overcome the impasse of modern thought and apprehend the universality and political dimension of human nature. It is not really true, but a belief that, held for rational, irrational reasons, excuse me, directs the person who holds it to act in a rational way. Since it cannot be grounded in people's understanding of human nature, liberal democracy must be grounded in a consensus based on a true enough, plausible-seeming set of beliefs about a progressive unfolding of history that has led people to the present. Once again, you see how important the political victories are because they constitute the refutation of the illiberal alternative. Disturbingly, the author continues, this means that the U.S. regime depends on what Fukuyama calls the democratic process, which the American right and left are both abandoning, or put another way, on the possibility of forming a consensus. But as he noted in 1989, when he complained of the uniquely universal consensus that misunderstood his ideas, a consensus, quote unquote, can be founded and is perhaps indeed likely to be founded on a shallow misapprehension of the truth. Ironically, in that same essay, bemoaning the popular caricatures of his complex argument, Fukuyama claims that one of the strongest reasons for having faith in the U.S. form of government is the remarkable consensus that has developed in the world concerning the viability of liberal democracy. Either Fukuyama was being quite foolish or he was up to something, signaling perhaps to what he understood to be a minority of attentive readers that the future of liberal democracy depends on its advocates' ability to secure public adherence to a view of history and its future progress that is perhaps not even a true opinion. Okay, I want to comment on this very briefly. You sometimes hear non-liberal democratic regimes and countries and thinkers characterized, as you well know, as fascist or neo-fascist, in part because they rely on a certain myth. They have a myth of national regeneration, or they have a myth of historical imperial greatness, or they have some sort of myth about gods, angels, demons, devils, and they project that myth onto geopolitics and thereby they justify their neo-fascist ways. Well, what we see suggested here is that even the acolytes of liberal democracy, even its most true and ardent believers, also have recourse to a myth recourse to something that's designed to secure public adherence to a view of history, but something that doesn't necessarily base itself in truth in the sense of an accurate account of the way things are, but that rather is designed to produce support and to keep things going in a plausible way. In other words, there's a myth and a mythical aspect to the defense of liberal democracy as I'm sure many of you already know, but it's always helpful just to uh, bring that out clearly. It's not a rationalistic position if we've called into doubt the universality of human nature, uh, which the German philosophers have forced us 
in some sense to do, especially in their American and French receptions. Okay, continuing. Writing to a bifurcated audience composed on the one hand of philosophers capable of understanding the truth as it really is, and on the other hand of gentlemen who, although incapable of this, can be led to a quote-unquote true opinion, a not entirely justified belief that will orient them toward desirable political action, all of that is a core element of the Straussian school. And indeed, I interject here, read Leo Strauss, study his school. I have some courses on him, but independently of that, read Strauss. This is important to understand. Strauss, Bloom, and other thinkers in this tradition influenced the number of figures outside the academy, such as commentator William Crystal, who translated versions of Straussian ideas to policymaking and influencing public opinion. Although versions of Straussian thinking continue to animate the political right today, including the extreme online right, the popular and deeply reactionary internet personality Bronze Age pervert, evinces a deep familiarity with the work of otherwise obscure Straussian political theorist Kostin Alamariu, as well as Strauss and Bloom. The peak of its perceived influence was in the early George W. Bush administration. So in other words, Strauss has influence. Strauss has influence on right-wing circles. He used to have them among neoconservatives, which I guess we're going to hear something about. And now he has them among circles on the very online right. Okay, you can also hear my discussion with Michael Anton at Claremont Institute where we talked about Leo Strauss and the right. I think that was a good conversation. The neoconservative clique that steered the decision to invade Iraq in 2003 was seen by many to be guided by Strauss's sense that the public could and indeed should be deceived by a noble lie. You guys, if you've heard anything about Leo Strauss, you might have heard, oh, Leo Strauss, Straussians, neocons, noble lie, invasion of Iraq, blood for oil, uh, pretense for invasion. That's somehow the distorted neocon caricature or, you know, how Strauss was filtered through neoconservatism and then characterized by the enemies of neoconservatism. You shouldn't confuse that with Strauss himself. Again, Michael Anton and I discussed that in our interview. It is with an awareness of Fukuyama's debts to the Straussian tradition that people should read his 2006 book, America at the Crossroads, Democracy, Power, and the Neoconservative Legacy. I haven't read it. If you have, you should comment about it. The ostensible aim of the book was to signal its author's opposition to the invasion of Iraq and the immoderate foreign policy ambitions of the George W. Bush administration. But Fukuyama began by defending Strauss's reputation from what he foresaw would be the disastrous legacy of the so-called policymaking gentlemen of the neoconservative movement. Gentlemen, you should know, is a technical term in the world of Straussian commentary. Okay, they're the sub-philosophical political players and the philosophers, as it were, feed them plausible accounts of the world in order to have them act prudently, well, uh, without fully understanding the real basis of their action, the real basis of its judgment as good. There we have Alan Bloom, okay, a picture of Alan Bloom, translator of Plato's Republic, wrote many good books, translated Rousseau's Ami. Uh, you should read Bloom as well. Strauss and his many students practice an esoteric art of interpreting texts, seeking hidden meanings, and in their own writings, they used a variety of techniques to provoke careful readers to greater thoughtfulness. One of these, dear to Strauss, was a kind of numerology by which certain authors supposed, excuse me, supposedly used specific numbers and characteristic ways to signal that the claims on the surface of their text conceal something else. Italian diplomat Machiavelli, for example, was said by Strauss to have used the number 13 and its multiples for this purpose. Okay, so one of the things that Strauss was known for in his circle of scholars was the thesis that authors tend to write between the lines. They use an art of writing to conceal their true meaning. And one of the moving parts in this art of writing is a kind of numerology. So we continue. The 13th footnote of the chapter on Strauss in America at the Crossroads directs readers to the conclusion of Strauss's most important work, Natural Right and History. So the suggestion here is that Fukuyama is using the numerology of the number 13 with a little wink to Straussians in his chapter on Strauss, directing us to the conclusion of Strauss's most important work, Natural Right and History. In that passage, Strauss makes a critical distinction between two views of how the best constitution, the best form of government that could be enacted, could come about. The classical view of the ancient Greeks, which was likewise held by leaders of the American and French revolutions, was that the best constitution is directed toward a variety of ends, 
which are linked with one another by nature, and that these ends could be identified, ordered, and satisfied by a quote-unquote contrivance of reason, a regime designed on the basis of an understanding of human psychology. The alternative view, which Strauss saw as arising from the counter-revolutionary writing of economist Edmund Burke, but rapidly thereafter becoming the very essence of modern thought, held that the genesis of the sound social order must not be a process guided by reflection, but must be left to the free play of supposedly so-called natural forces accumulating throughout history. I pause, by the way, and say anybody who wonders about the relationship between Strauss and Burke and Strauss's so-called hostility towards Burke or anything like that, it really rests on this question, on whether Burke was properly philosophical, properly theoretical, and properly held that the sound social order should be guided by a process of reflection. Here we see Strauss's view that he did not. Strauss took Burke to be the father of an understanding of politics in which human beings are tasked primarily not with using their reason to determine which way of living together best satisfies the demands arising from human nature, which is what classical political philosophy does, according to Strauss, why he teaches us about it, why he defends it, why he loves it, but rather with determining the meaning of history. A conservative version of this historicism holds that history has completed its work in one's own way of life, and people have nothing more to do than to be grateful and preserve it. A progressive version holds that the work of history is not yet finished, and that people can look forward to further development, which may take the form of a new life arising out of the old, such as the Marxist theory of history, or simply the spread of one's own way of life to all other people in the world, a liberal, progressive, and neoconservative ideal. All these were anathema to Strauss. In other words, Strauss himself would not ever have supported something like an end of history thesis that we have history progressing towards a final teaching or progressing towards a final version that then has to be expanded and universalized. No, he wasn't a historicist. He was a thoroughgoing anti-historicist for our purposes, okay? Inciting this passage through a footnote whose number readers of Strauss would know to be significant, the number 13, Fukuyama was perhaps reminding a tiny audience of neoconservative intellectuals steeped like him in the work of Strauss and his students that while he put his hopes for liberal democracy's future in the creation of a consensus around a progressive understanding of history, namely history le leads towards the mutual recognition preserved in a rights-based state of liberal democracy, uh, although he did that, he himself knew that the U.S. regime, philosophically speaking, depends not on the plausible untruth held in such consensus, but on the truth about human nature. He was perhaps warning them, the literate Straussians among the neoconservatives, that while they were trying to spread liberal democracy throughout the world at gunpoint, the United States was already in danger at home, insofar as even elites who ought to have been taught better by Strauss were now embracing an immoderate dangerous version of the progressive vision of history. They lacked the capacity for moderation, perhaps because they had forgotten that this vision is not, strictly speaking, true. Again, the vision of the superiority of liberal democracy to all of its alternatives. It is only a true enough story told to an unphilosophical audience. Moving on here. Fukuyama, and by the way, thanks everybody for being here. We're reading this article, The Postmodern Radicalism of Francis Fukuyama, in foreignpolicy.com magazine, which you should look at, subscribe to, read. And uh, I had to share this with you because as you see, we've got Strauss, we've got Bloom, we've got Bap, we've got neoconservatives, we've got liberalism, illiberalism. How could we not read this together? Fukuyama thus broke with the neoconservative movement with which he had previously been identified. He also began a political evolution that seems to have left him without access to policymakers sympathetic to both his concrete recommendations and broader worldview. Now, it is not clear who he wants to speak to. In a 2018 interview with columnist Wesley Yang on the publication of his penultimate book, Identity, the Demand for Dignity and the Politics of Resentment, he said he is now giving policy recommendations to, quote, an audience that is unlikely to heed, unquote, his advice. The advice indeed is quite reasonable and flows logically out of the psychological analysis of human nature that Fukuyama made in his end of history thesis, which is perhaps just why it isn't being heeded. It's only pause. 
Again, the idea here is that if you base a political teaching on insight into the nature of human beings, it's too recondite. It's too difficult for non-philosophers and non-intellectuals to grasp. You have to make your argument on something else, not on the truth about human nature, not on the truth about the human soul, but on some sort of plausible uh, story. He warns that American politics has become so shrilly polemical and so anti-democratic in part because Americans are increasingly unable to secure the fundamental human need for dignity by means of a common national identity. The universal egalitarian premises of liberalism can only be given a psychologically satisfying concrete expression within a bounded democratic state that has a coherent national identity. Of course, people's needs are not only symbolic, but nor can even their desire for equality be satisfied merely with verbal expressions from politicians. Rather, to feel their self-worth affirmed as equal members of a greater whole, individuals must be able to experience in the material quotidian patterns of their lives that they possess the necessary resources to maintain what they understand to be respectability. This includes not only a minimum of physical well-being, but what redistribution programs alone cannot provide, a sense of contributing to the community through work and service, of having safe forums for expressing and sharing one's beliefs and traditions, and also of having neutral, reliable public institutions in which conflicts over such values can be suspended through common identification with transcendent national purposes. And as you read that or hear me read it, you see how badly all of that is lacking now. Only a strong state, strong enough to control flows of people, goods, and capital over its borders, as well as to restrain conflicts over subnational identities and moral commitments, can maintain the security, economic prosperity, and relative material equality necessary to satisfy people's basic human desires. Fukuyama enjoins moderation to culture warriors of the right and left, and he calls on a patriotic ethic that would recognize national unity and security as the necessary preconditions for tolerance, diversity, and comfort in one's private associational life. These calls, though, lamentably, I add here parenthetically, have been just as ineffective as his warnings about the war in Iraq. Preaching moderation to political elites, reining in their partisan and personal ambitions, and drawing their attention to the urgent need to rebuild America's material infrastructure, civic institutions, and faith in a common national purpose seems both necessary and perhaps impossible in Fukuyama's eyes. The Straussian tradition holds the promise that it could teach elites moderation by making them aware of the critical distinction between the publicly avowable justifications for one's political way of life and its true philosophical and almost ungraspable principles. The sense of such disjuncture, although it may have often given elites a false sense of their intellectual superiority over ordinary people, or indeed their right to deceive them, also at least potentially kept them alive to the fact that precisely because history had not truly ended and never could, they needed to keep supplying the public plausible grounds for such faith with their words and deeds. The notion that there are two justifications for liberal democracy aimed at different audiences could function in this sense, like Fukuyama's warning that the balance between isothumia and megalothumia in the US regime is inherently unstable. By drawing attention to a delicate, unsteady equilibrium, both ideas ought to inculcate prudence. But from Fukuyama's own admission, it seems neither the lineage of Straussian thought taken up by neoconservatives, whom he separated himself from, them because you remember they went too much in the direction of progressive historicism, nor his own efforts to continue the heritage of Strauss and Bloom in a more politically pragmatic vein has succeeded in these terms. So he hasn't succeeded in getting people to be prudent. His two messages haven't landed, as it were, anywhere. If the task of the philosophically minded friend of liberal democracy is to influence elites to make reasonable political decisions to secure the stability of the regime, while convincing a wider public that history is on its side, then both iterations of Straussianism, namely the neocon one and this other more politically pragmatic one, seem in their juggling of multiple audiences to have let the balls drop. Perhaps a dissatisfaction with the Straussian paradigm, the author continues, 
accounts for one of Fukuyama's most perplexing intellectual ventures, an enormous two-volume series that traces the history of humanity down to the present as the advent and diffusion of liberal democracy. The origins of political order from pre-human times to the French Revolution, 2011, and political order and political decay from the Industrial Revolution to the Globalization of Democracy, 2014, are sweeping but superficial accounts of world history as a teleological movement toward the end of history, presented in almost the very caricature Fukuyama had once objected to being identified with. These books are too long and too learned to be popular, and they have no obvious connection to contemporary policy. But they're also too shallow and unreflective to be of interest to the sort of readers who might plumb the depths of the end of history in The Last Man or Fukuyama's other more esoteric writings. They speak neither to a philosophical elite, nor to policymakers, nor to a general audience. It is as though Fukuyama, having exhausted the Straussian paradigm, now articulates and celebrates the virtues of liberal democracy, seen as history's ultimate meaning, to an audience he's no longer certain of. Fukuyama holds, and we're getting near to the end of the article here, then I'll say a few things and we'll stop, maybe pop over into the chat. I do see some nice comments there. Fukuyama holds that the U.S. regime needs to be seen by its citizens as a vessel of historical purpose to survive. Think about it. Again, I add my commentary here. Think about the symbolic significance to American liberal Democrats and their supporters of the war in Ukraine, because you could say it provided the West with newfound meaning and purpose, showing that liberal democracy, represented here by Ukraine, is always under threat by fascist, authoritarian, dictatorial, neo-fascist, neo-Nazis represented by Putin. And therefore that liberal democracy, you need ever vigilant. You need to be ever vigilant in the defense of liberal democracy. You can't take it for granted. I think the war provided liberal Democrats with that type of um, legitimating version or interpretation of world events. Fukuyama holds that the US regime needs to be seen by its citizens as a vessel of historical purpose to survive and that its leaders, in turn, must give citizens good grounds for such a faith in their rhetoric and policies. But for liberal democracy to endure, people also require another kind of faith, a trust in the possibilities of speech. They must find themselves having good enough reasons to believe that by speaking to the public, whether or not they take it to be composed of multiple audiences, they can bring something like the truth to its attention and inspire reasonable beliefs and actions. That is to say, people's faith in liberal democracy rests on a more fundamental faith in democratic rhetoric. The mode of address that Fukuyama precisely laments is so deficient in American politics today. He regrets that politicians have abandoned its practice, appealing to their radicalized bases instead of to a potential consensus that could be shared by a wide majority of citizens. His own rhetoric, however, now seems to speak to no audience in particular. You know, he's not addressing the philosophers, quote unquote, he's not addressing the gentlemen, he's not addressing the people, who's he addressing? Understood as a growing distrust in the possibility of political speech, the plight of liberal democracy, whatever reassuring news may appear in the headlines, is dire. And Fukuyama, for all his apparent optimism, offers a warning that it is not history, but people's faith in it, and thus in their form of government, that may end. Okay, that was Blake Smith, very nice article. Blake Smith, Fulbright Scholar in North Macedonia. This was in foreignpolicy.com, which you should go have a look at, read free articles, subscribe, do whatever. Not behind a paywall at the moment anyway. The Secret Postmodern Radicalism of Francis Fukuyama. Cheers for liberal democracy in public. Quietly admits he's unsure of its true strength. It put its finger on a lot of very nice problems there about Straussian rhetoric, the limitations of it, its distortion in the neoconservative circles, uh, Fukuyama's inability to have a kind of well-grounded, non-neoconservative Straussian defense of liberal democracy. We saw the importance of Strauss on the right today in a completely different way, obviously, from the neoconservatives because the very online right, including BAP, uh, and you'll see this in my conversation with Michael Anton at the Claremont Institute if you pull it up, uh, today's Straussian right is not neoconservative. It's distinct from neoconservatism. It doesn't have this faith in a universal historical progress. So that's a fascinating issue, the reception of Strauss on the right today, not just the reception of the Strauss on the right then. 
when the neoconservatives were reading him, which of course some of them still are. Uh, so a nice article there. I hope that you got something out of that. And uh, if you've never heard of this author before, now you know. I don't mean uh, Fukuyama, obviously Fukuyama, Bloom, Strauss, Bapp, everyone else we mentioned. But you should know the author of this piece, very nice piece, Blake Smith, Fulbright Scholar in North Macedonia. So we used to do these article readings together. It's been a while since we did one. And uh, I thought that was just the perfect opportunity too. Thank you for spending your time here. Great to see you. I want to hop into the chat here for a moment. And by the way, I'm not trying to, I just have to tell you, right? Strauss, Plato, Schmidt, Heidegger, Fukuyama, I mentioned as well in one of the courses, millermanschool.com. Do have a look. That's how I offer my teaching. Okay. I do these free live streams with you, which is very enjoyable. But as far as uh, making a living, among other things, I run that school. You should have a look and see whether you find something there that you like. Let's go through some of the chat comments here. Should I just scroll up to the top? Okay, let's try that. So Sebastian, it's my pleasure. I'm uh, glad to be with you, as I say. Jay Fukuyama wants Purple Caesar. Uh, could be, I should say, I have not read a lot of the recent works by Fukuyama that are mentioned in that article, so I don't know how well they are represented. Interesting thesis nonetheless. Fukuyama deliberately refuses to put himself in the other person. His intentions are uh, offend other societies by implying that they're uncivilized and only the Western model can save them. Yeah, if you read, for example, Strauss, excuse me, not Strauss, uh, Dugan's criticisms of Fukuyama, you'll see that he tries to show from the Russian perspective the limitations of the end of history model, both politically, uh, both f politically, philosophically, and you could also say mythologically, because Dugan, needless to say, has his own legitimating myths. Uh, I appreciate when you find and translate these sorts of articles. It's my pleasure. I enjoy reading them and I'm grateful to the authors and the publications. When liberals are anti-religious, but they can't avoid to turn science into a religious paradigm. Well, it's a serious problem because the faith in science needs to have some sort of legitimation. And the question is, can it have a scientific legitimation or not? You know, so that's a problem that for Strauss at any rate, Nietzsche raised, Husserl raised. Can we take the scientific world interpretation as a foundation if science itself is somehow an ungrounded mode of human world interpretation. Uh, in other words, why science? So Nietzsche raised the question, why science? Husserl raised the question about the way that science is rooted in the pre-scientific. You can read the crisis of the European sciences, for example, to get a little bit of that. But yeah, faith in science means that the ground of our scientific world interpretation is not itself scientific. Very serious intellectual problem. Uh, well analyzed by some very smart people, like I said, including Husserl, Heidegger, and Strauss, and Nietzsche. Uh, groups need common beliefs, Brian, you wrote when I asked at that time. So you can derive a lot of pretty fun fundamental insights about the nature of political life if you really pull on this thread. Groups need common beliefs. The political grouping is the political community organized as a regime, a regime that has certain basic ideas that need to be legitimated. And what if you're somebody who calls those into question? You know, that's why all classical republicanism, like I recently posted on my Twitter, supports a certain kind of censorship because for the common good, for the good of the political community, you can't constantly be pulling the rug out from under your own feet. But the rug is the common beliefs. And when you philosophize, you pull that rug out because philosophy always subjects belief to further uh, rigorous questioning. Anyway, big, big, big theme in Strauss's work. And I think properly so, because it belongs to the nature of political life to have that kind of tension. Uh, Mr. Jaynes writes, as a society, they've already agreed to many commonalities. I don't think a spiritual connection is necessary. Okay, yeah, so the, it may not be that the common beliefs that bind a group together have to be quote unquote spiritual. They may be something else that provide a basis for a common identity, a sense of a common mission or common fate that we're all in it together in some way. Uh, we feel pain at the same things and are pleased by the same things. As Plato wrote in the Republic, he said, one of the things that characterizes a good political community is that it is one. It has the same pains and pleasures. It's not like somebody killed somebody else and half the people are happy about it and half the people are sad, like a society split between the lovers of the victims and the lovers of the victimizers. Anyway, some comments here from Sebastian. I think society needs a common set of beliefs, but not as an elaborate ideology, but as tradition. 
Culture is the foundation of multipolarity. Tradition is the foundation of culture. Yes, but even here, you know, a problem, for example, in, this, in, uh, in Strauss, and Strauss sees it in Plato and these other texts, is that tradition is tradition, okay, but when you philosophize, you begin to think about tradition. And the tradition is always our tradition. But when you philosophize, you don't automatically think something is good just because it's yours. So to philosophize is also to call the tradition into question. Okay, so there are, uh, there are serious problems there, as I say. And they're relevant to what we just read about, you know, Fukuyama having on one hand to provide people with um, sound belief for what is ours, liberal democracy, uh, at the same time as he wants to leave open the possibility of a philosophical criticism or philosophical, at least, uh, insight and understanding. Uh, I don't want to comment too, too much here about culture because it's a very rich topic and Strauss and Heidegger both have important things to say about it, but I kind of want to save that for a separate stream. Ironically, liberalism is better at producing multipolarity than the fourth political theory. Maybe. Isn't Francis Fukuyama delusional? Or as Dugan once asked, is he already a robot? Well, I don't know about that. He has his arguments. He has his books. Our job is to read it, to understand it, think about it. If we see gaps blow them apart, I don't know, cover them over. Depends what you want to do with Fukuyama, but we should always read and think. Uh, there was a passage Brian Bob is referring to here, philosophers capable of understanding the truth. Um, a dispute over whether philosophers do or don't have special access to the truth. Again, I'll leave that aside. I recommend Plato's Republic for just that question. Uh, Jay, yes, in passing, I think that was what it was. Okay, those who saw it, saw it. Uh, my pleasure, again, William, Mr. Jaynes, Sebastian, no Dugan translations planned at the moment. As I might have mentioned before, I have translated one third of Dugan's second Heidegger book called Martin Heidegger, The Possibility of Russian Philosophy. Very nice book. I think it's a contribution to the scholarship on Russian political theory and on Dugan. But because he's currently under sanctions, I'm kind of spooked in releasing it. So I requested, you know, like... I have contacted my government about whether or not I have a right under the current sanctions law, whether I can get like, a, what do you call it? Uh, you know, like when it doesn't apply, where I have like a scholarly interest in the publication of this work. So hopefully they give me a exemption. But yeah, so at the moment, I'm not doing any new translations of Dugan and the one that I have done, I can't even release until I figure out whether I can do it. Anyway, why do I think that, who do I think Dugan hates more, BHL or Fukuyama? You know, if you watch Dugan's interview with uh, BHL, Bernard Henri Levy, you'll see that he has, he, how can you put this? He thinks that BHL is largely right in his analysis, uh, Empire and the Five Kings, about the United States as an empire of nothing and about the rise of new empires in the world. So he thinks that the analysis, somehow BHL's analysis of the situation is correct, but BHL doesn't want the uh, the five kings to arise and Dugan does. So in other words, I think Dugan has some intellectual respect both for the people that he disagrees with, uh, B for both of these people, BHL and Fukuyama. I don't think he hates them. I think he finds their philosophical and political analysis to be limited. If he hated Fukuyama, I don't know that he would be, he interviewed him before, as I said, he's been interviewed uh, together with him. He's written about him a lot, thinks about him a lot, or has responded to the end of history thesis several times. And, uh, yeah. Okay. I think I need to stop here shortly. I have some other things to get to, but I just want to, once again, thank you for being here. Once again, direct you to foreignpolicy.com, to that article that we read, and uh, to millermanschool.com if you are looking for courses. So thank you for your time. See you in the next video.